Um, so this talk, actually, I realize now that I've seen it up there, it's a long title, um, which is something that a lot of people say, I realize, and I, I, it bothers me people say that because a lot of people think it's the right title. So it's not exactly totally the wrong title. So I have my most recent book really mentioned is called Making English Western. It's about how English became a Western country, and I guess with all of what that means. And the project that I'm working on now, uh, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, that comes out of this. It refers back to some of the things I talked about in Making England Western, uh, and it refers to still the process of uh, occidentalization that took place within England to make it a modern Western country, and especially in this particular uh, talk, uh, to the processes that unfolded within London itself as what would ultimately become a Western city, but the current 19th century is still not at all recognizably a Western city. The Western population and forced the place of the inevitable question of what does it mean to be a Western city and to be a Western people, and that's what the project is all about. Uh, I should also add that this paper in particular is about forms of resistance or questioning of this project to westernize and occidentalize England. And I locate uh, certain forms of resistance in writers like Charles Lamb, which I'm writing about right now, uh, and also Blake, who remains to me one of the enduring kind of uh, and really subjected to um, kind of placeholder for a certain stubborn resistance to the process of occidentalization and westernization taking place in his own in London. He was one of London's uh, greatest poets. So I want to begin actually with a, one of the Blake's most famous works, poem on experience in London, which I'm not going to read the whole thing, but if you have way. But uh, the opening bit is important for our purposes. I wander through each chartered street, near where the chartered Thames does flow, and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. And I want to begin today by asking what it means that the narrator of Blake's London wanders through each of the city's chartered streets, and, and, and he uses that particular term, wander. Uh, most of the scholarship on this place from Song's experience suggests that the charters that Blake refers to here, uh, involve simultaneously spatial and political economic forms of restriction. The disruption and even the immobilization of free movement, for example. The imposition of a regulating grid on London's streets and even its river. At the time Blake was writing, there was indeed a set of newly launched processes in play all around him that aimed at rewriting the space of London literally, uh, as well as figuratively. Um, uh, partly by translating its spaces into new and mathematically knowable, rationally governable uh, concepts and new maps that were being formed. I'll talk a little bit about those in a little bit. Um, and also uh, materially, by, by literally bulldozing, bulldozing, demolishing certainly some neighborhoods and rebuilding them uh, through this whole period of talk. We'll return shortly to the question of the mapping and material transformation of London in the late 18th. But it's worth lingering on the words that have been somewhat too hastily taken for granted by much of the scholarship on Blake, namely wander and especially through. I wander through each other's street. Blake's implication of wandering has too often been seen as evident in his participation in the romantic ethos of natural movement, freed from the artificial constraints of urban life. The kind of movement that we see, for instance, in Coleridge's This Line Free Bower My Prison where the ability for the courage to wander in gladness and wind down for chance to that still roaring dell is so sharply contrasted with the stunted and circumscribed uh, facts of life in the great city tent, Coleridge, to which Coleridge imagined wrongly to turn up his friend Charles Lamb, based in London, must feel condemned. London, London uh, Lamb, as you see in a minute, actually loved London. There are many reasons why such a stereotypically romantic understanding of wandering is not very helpful to understanding Blake's work. Uh, no more to Blake than it is to understanding Lamb's work, which we'll come back in a little bit. But for now, just consider the fact that Henry Fielding devotes a whole section of his 1751 inquiry into the causes of the late increase of robbers, one of the earliest manifestos on the need for a police force. Uh, specifically to the discussion of urban wandering, which he sees as a gravely dangerous 
problem. And this is a passage I have in mind. Whoever considers the cities of London and Westminster with the late vast vision of their suburbs, the great irregularity of their buildings, the immense number of lanes, alleys, ports, and high places, right here, must think that had they been intended for the very purpose of concealment, they could scarce have been better contrived. Upon such a view, the whole that is all of them appears as a vast wood or forest in which a thief may harbor with as great security as wild beasts do in the desert of Africa or Arabia. For by wandering in excess of from one part to another, and often, and often shifting his quarters, he may always be said to avoid the possibility of being discovered. So part of the feeling one could propose in his inquiry, of course, is if not the actual erasure, which would happen later that immense number of lanes, alleys, courts, and by places, and they were created by open boulevards. Uh, as I said, that would happen in the 19th century, after the time. Then at least a new mode of surveying and mapping London, rendering its hidden spaces more regular, more transparent, more fully legible, scrutable, knowable, discoverable, surveyable. But part also of what he wants to call for involves the immobilization of certain kinds of people, following their movements in and through the property the eradication of urban wandering. The prohibition of wandering is central to the new mode of policing advocated by Peterson because it would be, he says, and I'm quoting him here, impossible for any thief to carry on his trade long with impunity among his neighbors and where not only his person is secure, but his way of life must be well known. Wandering is problematic then because it undermines the system of police and surveillance still heavily dependent on the intimacy of local knowledge and identification, something that the forest of wanderers and travelers makes impossible. The eradication of wandering would ensure the maintenance of metropolitan space as known, visible, transparent, verifiable, predictable, and so forth. The result would be a city altogether lacking in what we, strangely enough, consider that most quintessential attribute of modernity to anonymity. Strangely enough, then, Ewing's argument is driven by a central he is, on the one hand, advocating a modern policing logic based on knowledge, identification, and surveillance, which, of course, anticipates by what, a couple hundred years the unrivaled network of CCTV cameras all over London. You can't, you can't dream about 10 cameras in London at the same time. But he's also, on the other hand, taking a remarkably traditionalist and paternalist uh, position and insisting on pinning people down to their original locale, preventing the movement. Given that the mobility of labor, freeing labor precisely from the kinds of impact, would be absolutely central to the development of a properly modern labor market, and hence a recognizably modern economy in Britain. Moreover, the very planning logic of modern cities is, as Richard Sennett has argued, precisely based on facilitating the movement of anonymous individual bodies through a smooth urban space. Logic that began to be implemented in the urban planning of London in the very beginning of the 19th century. In this context, Drake's emphasis on wandering movement and anonymity as vital parts of urban experience seems, in contrast to Fielding's retrograde attitude to urban wandering, remarkably modern. So here we are talking about one of the great romantic poets as remarkably modern by comparison to one of the adequate. And that's it's that paradox. You know, how can we think of Blake as modern? It's not supposed to be, I mean, Romantic is supposed to be the sort of enemy of the urban capital. Here he is articulating very much an urban form, a uh, modern form of urban experience, the, the right to wander. Yet Blake is also clearly pushing against a different conception of urban modernity that, 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 that form that's invested in regulation and control, and order and transparency, and surveillance and knowledge. Ford's feeling was among the earliest to articulate this other conception of modernity, not based on surveillance and knowledge. And the line of thinking that he begins to articulate will be picked up by Patrick Kilkoon and others in, in the 1790s and on into the 19th century uh, in advocating a method of policing that, in which people are kept under constant surveillance. The point here, and this is the first stage of my argument, is that urban modernity, which we see being articulated in fits and starts, 
in and among these dissonant contradictory passages, among many other places, of course, has never had a single long form, neither at the moment when it first emerged nor at any time since. On the contrary, the modern city has been, and still is, a site for the articulation and contestation of different modes of modernity. In the decades around the turn of the 19th century, we can see the articulation and institutionalization of what would become a familiar modern set of ways of surveying and governing London in the unilinear time of development. And at the same moment, we can see an antagonistically different way of inhabiting and understanding what some of these take to be the multiple dissonant layers of urban space time, an alternative way of thinking through the dynamics and possibilities and policies. Thus, what I want to suggest for now is that the wandering we see in Blades London is of a distinctly modern and urban form, even if it is written in defiance of what would ultimately emerge as the dominant modern structure of controlling spatio-temporal channels, but is gradually coming to be imposed on London in Blades Lifetime. I'd like to propose then that we think of this as a romantic <coughs> alter-modernity rather than anti-modernity, which is a romanticism. Uh, and which, you know, thinking of romanticism as anti-modern and an ultimate lines up people like Blake, people like Wordsworth on the countryside. They, in fact, if you think about it, there really is not that much time those two and some of others together. Hence the significance of the act of wandering through and through each of London's chartered streets. We'll go back to the way. As though the act of wandering defines not simply or a local instance and moment of control, but rather the overall logic underlying and sustaining them all together. To wander through any one chartered street is to defy the logic of them all, in search perhaps of those roots and temporal modes not charted, not chartered, not improved. Improvement, as Blake writes in the matter of heaven and hell, makes straight roads. But the crooked road without improvement are the roads of Wandering is, in this sense, an act of resistance, but it would be a mistake to see the word that word, resistance, only a negative term, as an attempt to push back against the regime of spatio-temporal control. For this kind of wandering also expresses, in positive terms, the modern city's capacity to continuously and unpredictably generate and sustain different modes of encounter and interaction, marking, in both senses of the word, that defy any attempt to Indeed, wandering is this new mode of encounter. To wander in this sense is to inhabit a certain mode of modernity which the city makes possible, albeit with an eye to the provisional, the temporary, the momentary, rather than the larger frame of developmental time, progressive, cumulative time, linear time, which would prove essential to the dominant mode of modernity. The tension here, in other words, is between two different orders of modernity, between an attempt, on the one hand, to define the city as it were from above, to impose order on its spaces and time, and render its landscape coherent and knowable, to capture its residents to new and regular, predictable, developing, uh, or accelerating the mode of life. And on the other hand, an experience of the city as a site that allows the continuous reshaping in many different overlapping and contradictory time and places, moments, and provisional, hastily assembled and disassembled conjunctures of the ways in which bodies, materials, ideas, objects, and emotions connect and interact with one another. Blake being Blake, we quite literally see and hear these tensions crackling through the surface of the text in the confrontation between, on the one hand, what William Winslow identified long ago as the poem's phonemic tune that that prominent and stark, almost harsh succession of similar emphatic syllables that drive the verbal text along. And on the other hand, the plate's constant flight or slippage into other modes, the oral, that is A-U-R, the ear, the visual, the corporeal, blood and signs and tears and curses, all of which take place in the As is the case with all the plates illuminated books, uh, and I'd be happy to go back to this field talk about it. Uh, the visual components of the play disrupt the linear rhythm of the words, 
making available ways of reading to create layers that remain steadfastly irreducible to the words of the poem itself. Blake's London reminds us always and again of the sheer folly of trying to reduce urban life and all its plenitude to a one or two dimensional alphanumeric register, the flat surface of a map. And this is something that Blake could extend from London to this poem into other longer works where we see an ongoing struggle over urban space and the tension that the book tracks between the different urban forms of London and of Jerusalem, Jerusalem itself. The capacity to imagine and inhabit the city as multiple, dissonant, contradictory, sometimes crazily overlapping layers of spaces and times, which is central to Blake's project in the London Army, is what the urban sociologist Abdul Malik Simon refers to as cityness. I'm going to quote Simon here. For all the efforts made to ensure accountability, order, and the transparency of how things work and decisions get made, says Simon, cityness continues to haunt the city. This is because, in the same place and time, another set of conditions, another way of doing things, another reality, have always already been possible, and in an important way, were always already in place. Thus, Simon argues. Urban modernity is characterized by two contradictory senses of time. In addition to the time of development and modernization and the conventional sense of which they belong to make, a city, he argues, quoting them again, is full of memories about what has taken place in the past. And those memories also include a certain amount of imagination, of hopes and dreams that the city could have been a certain kind of place, but one that never seemed to reach fruition. These imaginations, he adds, have never fully gone away. And the city remains a place of dreams, present and past, of bits and pieces of ways of doing things that never really had enough time or support to fully implant themselves. Simone primarily has in mind here contemporary third world cities like Jakarta and Lagos and Cairo and Beirut. But as I hope to show, what he says goes equally well for London at the turn of the 19th century. In thinking through these questions, in fact, it's essential to bear in mind that during the revolutionary and military crises of the 1790s and on into the 19th century, especially in anticipation of the French Revolution, the French invasion of England after the Revolution, the British government possessed no accurate maps of its own territory. Literally, there, was, there were no known maps of the entire country. William Roy, who had carried out the first systematic mapping of the Scottish Highlands during the brutal campaign of occupation and pacification of that territory, had been calling for a military survey of the national space for decades, as well as the violence that we've seen. That project finally got underway in 1791, the first method, the first official project to map out the space of the country. I mean, we, we take it for granted the government possess maps, and in our day and age, the NSA is mapping everything times a million. But back then, you can see by the government doesn't even know, it doesn't have any time. How do you run a country? You don't have so this project got underway in 1791 as the military board of ordinance was charged with the task of mapping Britain on the basis of the National Geographical Survey <coughs> launched from the baseline taken near uh, what's today Heathrow Airport. A unique division of the national territory into progressively smaller and smaller squares designated by letter and number through which the exact location of every spot of the nation's landscape could be identified. It was not, however, until the 1840s the Ordnance Survey extended its trigonometrical and mapping project into London. Until the middle of the 19th century, in fact, neither the British government nor any of the patchwork of local authorities in or around the province possessed any truly accurate maps of the metropolitan space. There were, of course, plenty of maps of London before then. Um, but the existing maps of London, produced by private entrepreneurs, including the great growth map of London in 1746, were riddled with contradictions and inaccuracies, not only in terms of scale and measuring so speeds, sometimes even entire developments that would not exist and wouldn't exist and never would exist. <laughs> so to use these maps to actually find your way around would not necessarily be always very uh, productive. Uh, when Richard Forward launched his project to clear this, this space and uh, produce a, a new, accurate, large scale map of London in 1790, middle of the revolutionary crisis. 
The attractive subscriptions for most of the London insurance companies, as well as local parish and rescue authorities, all of them were desperate for an accurate map of their jurisdiction. Although Horwood's 1792 to 99 map of London, which is immense, uh, far exceeded Rose in terms of accuracy, was still very much a product of the fall that's called the Dark Age of Urban Mapping. So crude that the Ordnance Survey planners were ready to dismiss it. The first Ordnance Survey map of London was a skeleton map of 1851. And I only have a very, very bad copy of it. That's the best I can do, but it still gives you a sense of how it uh, was the product of a much more rigorous and systematic approach to cartography. The skeleton Ordnance Survey marked the transition from an older, static view of the city to its conception as changing and progressing the The rational city is a legible city which is always possible to plot position and to imagine the relationship of parts of the form. The modern map performs its function. It compartmentalizes, classifies, and explains the logics of the problem. It lays out its boundaries and priorities. In addition to the kinds of tensions and struggles between conceptual systems and abstract grids, the Frank already discussed the reference to village geographies and the photographs and map streets, which are just as relevant to what's going on in the mind. There was, of course, already a distinctly colonial air politics. The first official survey of London was carried out, after all, not by a civilian authority, but by the government. It was a project that was very much an extension, uh, sorry, an expression of what Bernard Cohen distinguishes as the survey modality of modern colonialism. The logical extension of colonial mapping projects being carried out in the highlands of Scotland, in Ireland, and in India. The sense of the land captured ordered, and conveniently drawn across the Cartesian plane is what makes the maps of the Ordnance Survey selectively controlled as long as the plane. The gradual rationalization and ordering of London was not simply a cartographic function. From early in the 19th century, it was clear that ever that London needed a unified metropolitan government rather than a hodgepodge of local authorities that left wide swathe of no man's lands and other legalistic anomalies of the early court the liberty of the Savoy, which were physically in London, as it is in this day, to walk up to them in London, but, but in fact, administrators did not in London. In Kelly Court, for example, is administrated in English. So you didn't see it there. So there are these small kinds of spaces in London. Uh, road cleaning and maintenance, paving, street lighting, drainage and sewers, policing, and all the other matters of day to day urban management were until deep in the 19th century left in the hands of a patchwork of dozens of chaotically overlapping different authorities. Suddenly, and in conjunction with the project to provide new maps, there was a sense that the metropolis needed one authority for paving and sewage, which would be established in the country. There was a need for one central authority to assign street names and house numbers, both of which have been haphazardly applied and inconsistent demanded since the introduction of house numbers. And ever so slowly began replacing the older countries by identifying the building by describing the design of the over against some other building, which had long been seen as clumsy and inactive. I come from Beirut, I don't know, where to this day there may be something, I think the government probably has a map and that house number or some building numbers or whatever, but you know, literally nobody in the city, Beirut, the city too many people knows what the number of anything is. You ask for directions to some map. Uh, you, you have to read the really is systematically, it's near this, it's over this, it's at this, it's across the street from this, it's at this, it's for landmarks. You navigate the city, not according to the term that, what kind of street, James Street, you can do this, and so forth. It's, it's all about how you, you have to have a sense of landmarks, and so it's back that kind of So, I've often then, I have not yet taken this on that level, I meant to take what I thought to do, you know, ask a series of questions, see what she says. <laughs> I imagine he's going to say, you walk down the street and ask the guy over there with a... With a, with a <laughs> so I have no idea. Um, but anyway, that's how it was in London, through all the way in the 19th century, and suddenly... Uh, and by the way, if you look at some of these uh, earlier maps, you see the street names change all the time because somebody decides they want to change the name. It's not like the city decides. It's, it's, it's at, uh, so not until the 1850s, in fact, were street names and house numbers in London finally brought there was a need for a new police force, of course, uh, which, which, again, took place much later in the 19th century. None of this stuff was, you know, we did for 
prevent the fall. Uh, uh, moreover, the new mapping projects and the clearing away of bureaucratic and administrative anomalies were accompanied by an explosion of what we now call urban renewal projects in the first decade of the 19th century onwards, translating the spatial and temporal logics of the new cartography into the built and inhabited spaces of the city. Old London was a place of block mobility, of congestion and obstacle. The planners and reformers of Victorian London strove to dispel these obstructions and facilitate the movement of people, goods, money, water, and even air. The new urban ideal was uh, not irrational velocity or indiscriminate mobility, but ordered circulation through networks of streets, pipes, and tunnels. John Nash's Regent Street project, an ethical event of urban design according to Richard Sennett, uh, uses a continuous heavy traffic stream uh, to, to stream and, and to define and structure urban space. Nash's London was, as Senator points out, a site for speed. I want to register two points here before moving on to the next stage of my argument. First, from the turn of the 19th century on, urban circulation, movement, and speed were also seen to be the indicators of social and developmental movement, what we would today call modernization and conventional sense. A city, but also a people, a society, culture, block and stall is a city or a people or a culture or a society that is not developing from the perspective, not moving forward in the stream of developmental time. To remove blockages of all kinds, material and structural, but also, uh, but also political, cultural, and social ones as well, is to enable development in time. This goes for London, not just as for Ireland and for England. This is a question I discussed at length in the chapter on London in the book making in the Western. But suffice it to say that in a few decades around the middle of the 19th century, around 100,000 people were displaced, cleansed. I was really, I would use the term ethnic cleansing to describe the process, to describe the racial cleansing as being not white, not English only. They were, I don't know what it means to be white, whatever, whatever one means for that, so they, that's what they've been seen as now. But they were, anyway, removed from. Uh, the densely inhabited center of the metropolis, an area of about 30 minutes walking radius, uh, bounded by Charing Cross on the west, the Strand on the south, Holborn on the north, and Farringdon on the east. As their homes were demolished, it cleared the way for new urban developments, which were built, built on the new principles of speed and development, obliterating in the process existing urban fabric and speed. So if you go along the same speed, they, this is just in one part of the city, of course. These big These were all found through density packed in the world. And the people that used to live there, of course, removed and you know, given any grass to build those were just kind of spelled you know, and had to shift for themselves. The modernization and the westernization of London thus involved at certain moments a war against particular spatial temporal blocks that seemed to pose a threat to the constant blockages of the stream of developmental time. And the eradication of layered and convoluted density packed and lived in spaces. To make room for the new. In effect, what we have here is a war against the street as the site of their and unpredictable encounters. This kind of development opened up a line of thought in urban modernity that would run via Ausman in Paris and culminate in the Rococotier's own war against the street, though it was at work in London far earlier. There's an amazing passage from the Rococotier uh, that I want to draw your attention to where he says, the street consists of a thousand different buildings, but we've got used to the beauty of ugliness, so that is men making the best of our misfortune. Those thousand house houses are dingy and utterly discordant with one another. It is appalling that we pass on our way. On Sundays, when they are empty, the streets will be their full heart. This sea of lists and faces, nothing of all this exalts us with the joy of architectural promises. It is neither the pride which results from order, nor the spirit of initiative which is engendered by the wide, by wide spaces. Only pity and compassion born of the shock of encountering the faces of our fellow, and the realization which the English call the hard labor of our lives. The street wears us now, and when all is said and done, we have to admit it disgusts us. For him, then, 
the eradication of this seed of this and face it, the elimination of the boundaries of our fellows, marking the weakness and marking the world. And the face of the past is blank. I mark every face I can possibly do this mark. So it's all about the boundaries of face. So that was, that was what the city was for them. In this case, those homes in the county need to be wiped off, need to get rid of the rest of the city off, need to be in this uh, articulation of the event. This sense of development would culminate in the later 19th century and in the 20th century, uh, all to promise to, to, to rethink urban uh, thought early in the 19th century. Coleridge may have been convinced, as I noted earlier, that his friend Charles Lamb was pining away for rural freedom while in the great city of Penn, but nothing did have been further from the truth. Like Blake, Lamb had long been seen as a practitioner of more or less conventional, as a good work in uh, understanding of romanticism, schemes, and nostalgia, and sense of loss. Um, but for my part, I think we get the most out of urban figures like Blake or Lamb, or other ways like, like Mary Robinson, who has some amazing work on them. When we cross generic lines, rather than simply reinforcing them. Moreover, I think we can see in their engagement with the question of one another. Enough to make us be considered the very category of romanticism and its relationship to the event. From the South Sea House to the Strand, Cheapside and Fred Beaver Street to the Inner Temple, the running theme of Charles Lamb's writing on London has long been seen to be nostalgia and an accompanying sense of loss. Such a view was certainly made available by, for example, his essays on Christ's Hospital, where a complaint of the decay of beggars and prophets, or otherwise like the old factory. Um, but these things will make it easy to configure land in retrospect as someone looking backward rather than forward. It's actually, there are other ways to think about his encounter with America. Hazlitt once wrote of land that he does not march boldly along with the crowd, but steals off the pavement to take his way in the contrary direction. He prefers byways to highways. So in that last line, Hazlitt is putting his thing about something of vital importance, which is land rather than the straight movement through the As with also missing something here. It's not just that Lamb loved and was energized by the city, by the crowd. It's that we can see in his encounters with the sea of lists and faces in London streets, the basis for an understanding of urban modernity, which is strikingly similar to play. I don't have time to go into Lamb here, I'm telling you this whole Lamb is time uh, today, but if you read Lamb's essay, it's stunning how similar the article of Blake is saying for its approach on the poetry. And it's also worth noting the fact that Lamb is a huge admirer of Blake, which is very, very, very unusual. He was looking for a better urban Blake than if it had to go to the case. Lamb, Lamb, who was completely blown away by Blake, so especially his work on London and Virginia Street. So in, in writers like Blake and Lamb, this sense of time is articulated in time of the moment, rather than the linear developmental time, um, opens up from the surface of the written text into three or four or five dimensions, including the oral and the visual. And it's at odds, I think, with the clear, rational, or at least allegedly clear, rational, minutely legible and interchangeable aspect of American units of the greater space and time, which was being imposed on London. The London of Lamb and Blake, in other words, cannot be mapped in, in the conventional, two-dimensional sense. It can't really be assimilated to the approach to urban space time that was being articulated in the narrative of development in and through time. It speaks of that expression of cityness in the leaks of uh, Simone's term, which official dominant narratives have been trying to bring under control ever since in the attempt to regulate, not to co-op, take advantage of, what the court was the identified as the city of lists and faces. What I want to suggest uh, in, as, as, a, as a conclusion then is that we see in the work of such romantic writers an account of alternate learning, that mode of experiencing cityness, where in the movement, sorry, in the movement of visual, oral, sensual encounters of bodies meet, uh, where we see time itself slipping and sticking out, like work crashing. Even if their work resists that eventual, eventually dominant understanding of the be identified by Senate in terms of clock time and grid space, we must also read what they were doing in positive rather than simply negative terms. Partly that's because these divergent forms of the 
you know, how that you know, the resume existing to start black and white fighting in opposition. Wandering, seeing, marking, listing the uneven, unsteady collage of urban sights and sounds and colors and smells of this world constantly takes us to the edge of subjectivity and the self and returns us over and again to those moments, those time and present spaces where, as Senate it, itself turned outward and is aroused by the presence of strangers and arouses them in turn. Thinking of romantic ultimate energy spread from the far more conventional of energy and concern to which romance has been modern and um, opens up, I think, new ways to questioning romanticism itself. But what I want to stress in closing is that this articulation of urban ultimate energy and what Blake calls impossible history is anything but limited to the romantic period of London. On the contrary, I would say that we can draw lines of flight and of thought linking romanticism all the more closely in ways that various scholarly projects have hinted at have not really fully developed to modernism by, of course, all those astonishing moments in the great Victorian novels where unexpected encounters and twists open up even in the past, the great dizzying vista of the infinitely deep moments. There are many such moments, for example, in the Dickens last novel, and in the we just tie with them this huge disc that can be found, or certainly can't map it, with a two-dimensional rational mind. And this sense of ultra modernity is very much still with us today, even in cities like New York or London or Los Angeles, and much more so, much more so in the great cities of Africa and Asia and Latin America where we can see today, like nowhere else, what Simone captures as the incessant throbbing produced by the intense proximity of hundreds of activities. Cooking, reciting, selling, loading, unloading, fighting, praying, relaxing, pounding, buying, all side by side on stages too cramped, too deteriorated, too clogged with waste, history, and disparate energy and sweat to sustain all of them. For in that very persistence, and in the enduring memories and hopes and dreams of pasts and futures that may still come, we are reminded of the exhaustless potential of urban space and urban form. That plenitude of impossible history is always in place in the of crisis. I take Blake and Lamb and other letters to the problems, not as exceptional as but rather as representative examples of a tendency that exceeds them. An understanding of urban space and sight may be most productively thought through, not in maps and charts and diets, but in terms of what we the war and situations we used to call drifting or the disease, a way of mapping city psychogeography. This form of wandering, by interrupting or suspending our habitual response to urban space, opens a dialogue to what we can think of as a kind of urban spatial unconscious, something that is possible in all modern cities, but all the more so in those cities where, as Abu Malik Simon points out, the powers of urban regulation either haven't yet or simply can't keep up with the power, the urgent power of cities. And it's precisely in this sense, strangely enough, that we can get closest to the London of Blake and Lamb, not by visiting contemporary architecture, but rather by wandering in a very particular way through the as yet uncharted streets of contemporary Johannesburg, Cairo, Jakarta, 